Hello and welcome to another edition of Teacher Time for Infant and Toddler Teachers. I'm Emily Adams. And I'm Carol Bellamy. And we're so excited to be back with another fun episode. But first, we have a little business. We want to remind you that this is one of eight Teacher Time episodes this season. Each episode will have a follow-up coffee break where we answer the questions you send in during today's show. We'll remind you throughout the show to send in questions, but you can send them in anytime. Also, when we use the term teacher, we are really referring to everyone who works with infants, toddlers, and their families in an educational environment. So, we are including family child care providers, people who provide child care in centers who may not see themselves as teachers, but you are. Mm -hmm. And for everyone watching, we invite you to join us on My Peers, where we are creating a community for teachers to talk to each other and share their stories, successes, and questions. We hope you check it out. You'll find the link to join below. Last time we were here, we talked about using a responsive approach to curriculum. We know it's important to support children's learning by being responsive to their interests and developmental level. Today, we will talk about creating a responsive learning environment for infants and toddlers. That's right. That's right. Your curriculum likely has guidance for how to set up your learning environment. It's important to follow those guidelines as you implement curriculum. But you also want to adjust the environment to be responsive to the interests and developmental level of your children. For example, your curriculum might suggest ensuring that children have access to manipulatives, a bin with toys they can squeeze and mouth, feel and touch mm -hmm. as they learn about the attributes of objects. If you have several infants who are teething in your classroom, you'll want to be sure to have a bin with lots of items mm -hmm. that are safe for biting and chewing on because that's what exploration of manipulatives will be all about for that group of infants. Similarly, if you have a group of older infants who are beginning to stand up, cruise, and take a few steps, you'll set up your learning environment to accommodate more space. You might even end up putting some things in storage for a short period of time to give the infants safe room to move around. That's right. The Head Start program performance standards have really good information about the importance of young children's learning environments. Check that section mm -hmm. out. The standards say that environments should be responsive and foster trust and emotional security. What does that look like in your learning environment? Tell us in the chat box and we'll share your answers in a few minutes. So <clears throat> let's talk about ways that you can have an environment that really fosters trust and security. So one thing that we want to do is ensure that the environment is really welcoming for families. Um, you know, one way to do that is to create spaces for families to have their drop-off and pick-up routines and rituals. Um, you really want to make sure that your environment is accessible for all family members who might be there. That's very true. Another thing that's important is predictability. Mm -hmm. You don't want to rearrange the uh, environment too frequently because children need to have consistency. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's important is routines. Yeah. Our ch infants and toddlers spend most of their day in routines, mm -hmm. so it's important to make spaces for those routines that are comfortable for adults and children. Yes, absolutely. And we want to ensure that there's space for children to have, you know, one-on-one -on -one experiences yes. with adults, but also areas where a few children can play together, like in the block area, that sort of thing. So some small group experiences. Yes. Oh, and so important, take them outside. Yes. Uh, children love the fresh air. They need to mm -hmm. energize their brains, their body, and also the environment should always reflect the children and families. That's right. Yes. That's such a good point, Carol. And now we have a video of a teacher playing in the dramatic play area with children. They're washing dishes and setting the table. Let's take a look. You want to stir the food? Yeah. How about we put, ooh, bacon. I like bacon. Oh, are you going to eat it straight out of the pot? And some noodles. Que pasa? You want a pot? Or you want the bowls? Okay, let's wash them. Let's turn them on. I'll clean. Put it on the table. Let's wash it. Turn it on. I'll clean. Pon una mesa. Pon eso en la mesa. Voy a lavar este. Voy a encender. Okay, pon una mesa. Está limpio. 
I just love the play that's going on in that video. Um, what are some of the things that you noticed going I, on? I really loved how the teacher was speaking in English and in Spanish, yeah. just culturally welcoming mm -hmm. in that environment. Mm -hmm. Very easy. Yeah, it was nice. I like the way the dramatic play area was set up. Um, the children could really play there, um, but also it's important to note that's part of implementing the curriculum is sort of what you have available to play. Exactly. Um, but I also noticed that she really let the children lead yes. the play there. Yes, yes yeah. she did. Also, the environment supports children's play. They had the right size, kid size tables mm -hmm. and toys, just very appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives children, and also the children had opportunities to uh, have pretend, real pretend play. Yeah. You know, practice the things that they see every day, That's, like setting the table. Right. Kids want to do real things. Exactly. Yeah, that was exactly. really nice. So let's find out what you're doing to create learning environments that foster trust and security. And we do have a few chat answers. You can still send them in. Um, but we have Genevieve here who says, create your learning environment so the children will, will feel safe and comfortable. Um, bring or put materials that are familiar to them, like pictures of them and their family. Um, you know, it, it really sets the tone for their learning um, and to really pay attention to the children's needs. Mm -hmm. I have a chat response from Kalithia. She says it's all about building the, a nurturing relationship with the child mm -hmm. and his or her family. I love it when settings are responsive to child the child's natural environment, including family photos, mm -hmm. homemade books that display the child's engagement at the center with peers, props and learning centers that capture the children's interests, visual cues, soft, cozy spaces that allow the child to de-stress, and, and welcoming areas for parents to connect and effectively engage with the children upon greetings and departures. Oh, that's so thorough. That nice? Yeah, really nice. Yeah. Um, and we have one more chat answer from Martha, who really talks a lot about what we've been talking about already, which is having predictable routines and safe spaces. So um, I think it sounds like we have some similar ideas, and we'll be exploring some more. Thanks so much for sharing your wonderful ways you are supporting trust and security for young children. Now we have our language and literacy expert, Carrie Germeroff, from the National Center on Child Development, Teaching and Learning to talk about how to create a language-rich environment. Welcome, Carrie. So nice to see you. Hi, it's great to be back. And I'm excited to be here to talk about how a really rich environment can promote early learning, literacy and language. And to start that conversation, I'd like to watch some videos that will really illustrate this for us and, and pay attention to how the teachers are very responsive and the ch let the children take the lead. So let's watch the videos. More over there. What is you it? You see the mermaid and the fish? You are rocking and rolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at this one. Baby, I like yellow. So starfish. And a fish. You're reaching so hard. You're reaching for it. You're almost there. See this, the fish. Are you going to kiss the fish? Let's turn the page. You don't want to sit down. You just want to stand up. His bouncy legs, let's see. Sitting on the floor. Mama, Mama. First, come up here. You don't want nobody to fall over. Let me see. You're right, that is the letter S. That's the sun. And what else do you see? Those are called scissors. Remember when we cut out paper, we use scissors. That's the letter S. All right, you're going to put it here in the box or on the table. All right, there's one. That is the number one. Awesome. So, oh, know your number. Letter G, yes. What number is this one? Number seven. Number seven, you're right. And what are those? Yeah. Notice how the teachers tie the pictures on the blocks and in the books to real life objects. In the chat box, tell us how you use pictures in your learning environment to, port, to support language and literacy development. So Carrie, tell us about the video. What, what, do you, what can you tell us about the video? 
So just like you said, um, I love how both of these teachers are connecting symbols, whether they're symbols in a picture book with the baby or on a block, um, as the case with the little boy, to their, to their meaning um, by providing the vocabulary or um, the, the connecting it to a personal, meaningful experience. And um, so both teachers are very responsive as well. So the baby starts out on her tummy and she has access to, to the book. I love how it unfolds on the ground in front of her so she can be laid flat. And when the baby starts to get a little frustrated, the teacher picks her up and helps her to sit so that she can interact with the book um, from a different position, whatever that might be more comfortable to her. Uh, and she, she picks up on the baby's cues and introduces novel words uh, that the baby maybe is babbling about or seems excited or, or really interested in. And she's really matching that aff affect with the baby. Um, and I loved it with, uh, with the little boy, how when he brought over the block and pointed to the scissors, the teacher expanded on that and uh, she she said yes scissors just like we used to cut so again connecting that symbol with something that's very personally meaningful with yes. the child yeah. mm -hmm. so the teacher was really wonderful in her response you can tell she understands how to support language and literacy development mm -hmm. so Carrie tell us a little bit more about supporting infants and toddlers emerging language and literacy skills. Sure, there's a number of things that you can do and or set up the environment to support this and uh, having a uh, print in lots of different forms certainly is one of those and that'll encourage children to use print later on and prepare them for reading and print can be lots of things. It can certainly be books but it can also be um, labels on, on toy bins that the children are using. It can be their names on a their cubby. Uh, it can be uh, blocks like we just saw that have pictures or letters or numbers on them. It could be um, for, for uh, toddlers maybe uh, an alphabet puzzle that they can interact with the letters or putting posters up or um, the alphabet up at eye level in the room as well and making sure you have those conversations around those different symbols so that children can connect their meaning uh, with, with what they actually are seeing. So, so that's, that's certainly one way but also setting up a library in your room, so having small shelves that are easily accessible or baskets where the books can be um, easily displayed and their covers facing out so a child can choose based on what they see on the cover and making sure that those books have pictures that look like them as well, of course. Uh, and then having a really soft, cozy book nook area. Uh, we know that if children are comfortable reading or they, and they enjoy it, they're more likely to do it again. And then we don't want to forget liter writing. Um, writing is an important component, certainly, of, of liter literacy and language. And so having materials like uh, thick crayons or chalk or washable paint or washable markers are great so that children can have opportunities to practice putting their own marks on paper and having that conversation again to connect it with meaning. That's a really good point uh, and really interesting. Um, I know you also brought some pictures to illustrate what you're talking about. Yes, I did. And now these two classrooms certainly aren't exhaustive of everything you could do, but um, this first classroom presents uh, several different cozy and quiet soft spaces where the child might be able to read by themselves or with a friend or with a teacher. Uh, and then I love how the artwork is displayed on the walls so clearly they have access to writing materials and conversations about symbols are happening. Uh, some of the toy bins are labeled and then their books are um, facing out and easily accessible. And then in this next classroom, same thing, we've got some nice, quiet, soft spaces for reading. We have books, again, that are easily accessible. Children's print is all over the wall uh, in, in, this, in this classroom, and there's lots of nice functional print around the dramatic play area. So both of these classrooms present some really nice options. Right, that's wonderful. So what exactly is appropriate environmental print? So. That's right, we don't have to label everything. Uh, we want children to understand that print is for a purpose and it conveys a meaning and it's functional. So uh, ha making sure that they see you writing 
uh, and uh, you're writing this for a purpose. Maybe when you're writing a note home to mom and dad or about their day and explain and talk to the child about what it is you're writing so they can see that it's for a purpose. Um, being really uh, intentional about the different bins that you might be labeling. If we label everything, it becomes like wallpaper and, and children don't pay attention. And you know, a baby and toddler's world is full of symbols and it's our job to help them understand what those symbols mean. And so again, being really purposeful and intentional about what you do label is important. Great information. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was really great information Carrie shared with us. Now let's see what you had to say. So this is great. We do have Ashley who shared that she has pictures on the shelves of what belongs on the shelves. And so that really helps children figure out what, where things go, what to put away. Yes. Uh, I have another chat response. We have pictures of the children's families. Children love to go and look at them and mm -hmm. talk about them with their friends. Yeah. That's true. That is so nice. And then we have time for just one more answer, um, which is we use contact paper to put pictures and posters on the floor, which is fantastic, I right? Because that. then those sort of newly mobile crawling babies yes. have something they can crawl over to. Yes. Yes. I love that. Lovely. Thank you so much for answering the chat questions. Now we're joined by Alyssa Mwenlupembe, a consultant for early childhood programs. Welcome back, Alyssa. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Emily. It's so great to be here again. So last time you were here, we talked about having a responsive approach within your curriculum. Um, this time we're really talking about what does it look like to be responsive in your learning environment? The environment is so key to children's success mm -hmm. in their classroom. Um, I think especially when we're thinking about infants and toddlers, flexible spaces are very important. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working in an infant and toddler classroom, you're going to have a wide variety of ages and developmental um, areas that children are at. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be able to have a classroom that's appropriate for the smallest infants, but also for those two-year-olds that are, um, you know, really active mm -hmm. and engaged in their environment. And so making sure that you have a space that accommodates both of those ends of that spectrum mm -hmm. um, and also helps you to be successful in, in managing how you, know, you are able to uh, you know, approach each of those children yeah. at their different developmental levels. Yeah, wonderful. <clears throat> um, what else can you think of that sort of is a piece of that, ref that learning environment? I think an open-ended design and materials, okay. um, you know, making sure that the materials that you have available for the children are appropriate for those children in your classroom. Sure. Um, you know, you spoke at the beginning of the, um, the broadcast about, you know, if you have babies in your classroom, you're going to have lots of things that are appropriate for babies to put in their mouths. Right. Um, and so you have to have those things for the infants. But if you have older children, they're going to need things that are more complex. Mm -hmm. um, and so having lots of varied materials available um, that can grow with children or that can be repurposed in different ways mm -hmm. for wherever those children are on that developmental continuum. Yeah, wonderful. So tell me a little bit about... Um, how the environment can be reflective of children, yeah. the children in the environment. So we really want to make sure that children see themselves okay. in their classroom. Yeah. You know, we know this is a place where children spend a lot of their time. Yeah. We want to make sure that they know this is this is a place for them. Um, you know, photos of children mm -hmm. and their families, yeah. you know, are definitely important. But also having materials um, that are diverse, just like the children are diverse. Mm -hmm. So books. Um, pictures on the walls, um, baby dolls that are all reflective of the children that are in your care and also the community that you live and work in. Um, and really making sure that families feel that they see themselves yeah. when they walk into your classroom That's also. So important. Um, I feel like sort of under the foundation of all of this is really having um, adults who are capable of supporting all of this at the same time and yet having these really responsive interactions sure. within this environment. Well, we know the foundation of all early education is relationships. Right. And so when we have adults that are working with children that care deeply mm -hmm. and have those responsive, caring interactions with children yeah. and, and make sure that their environments are set up to support those children, all of those things are going to come together for a high quality environment. Wonderful. Thank you. I like the way you put that all together. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have a video now that does put a lot of this all together where we have a teacher who's with kids who are um, a young infant and then sort of a more mobile, almost toddler and then a toddler. And she really sort of makes this environment work for all of them. So let's go ahead and watch this video. Okay, great. 
is tired. There we go. Is that better? Uh, I think like four. There you go. Can you see yourself? Huh? Can you see yourself? There you go. What are you doing? Are you doing tummy time too, Tink? Huh? Is it time to rest? Do you want me to read that book to you? Or are you going to eat it? Oh, we thank you so much. Is that a grasshopper? And a bug? Like a bug like this? Look, there's a grasshopper. Like that. Oops, it's a spider. And a caterpillar. And a snail. And a slug. Oh my goodness gracious. Are we not liking that right now? Huh? No? Are you laying on the pillow too? Are we all done? You're just really, really, really fussy today. So sometimes when we show a video, there's so much going on mm -hmm. in this really short moment. Can you just talk about some of the things that you see? I think the thing that really sticks out for me is that that teacher is in a classroom with three children that are at three different developmental levels, Very. but she's able to meet the needs of each one of those children mm -hmm. in, in whatever way that they need that. Yeah. Um, and also I think her environment's set up to make that work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I think that it's, it's really important for teachers to be able to have the flexibility in their space to, to meet those needs. And so in, in that classroom, you saw that there were, there were the boppy on the floor, mm -hmm. you know, that was able to support that, that infant. Right. Um, and then, you know, the other little toddler-aged girl was, was kind of there and, and, and interacting, parallel yeah, play, a parallel with, play. That, yeah. <laughs> with that baby. Um, and then the toddler there had all those materials that were available mm -hmm. for him to explore in, yeah. in a way that he was ready to do that. Yeah, she did a really great job responding to mm -hmm. each of the children's needs. Um, so tell me, what are some of the other things that you see in that really rich video? I love the fact that the infants and toddlers were able to interact with each other yeah. and learn from each other. Um, I think we know that when infants are able to be with toddlers, you know, they, they get to see all the things mm -hmm. those toddlers are doing um, and learn so much. And, and toddlers learn that empathy um, and, and that connecting with the yeah. smaller children that's really important. They do. They want to take care of the babies, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's great communication. You yeah. know, that teacher interacted verbally mm -hmm. with all three children. Um, you know, I, I loved how as she was arranging the infant to get him, you know, a, a toy to look at. And you know, she she noticed that the, the little girl next to him wanted to try out what mm -hmm. Tommy time looked like for her. And, you know, she commented on that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, asking the little boy with the book, you know, do you do you want to eat that or do you want to read it? You know, anything yes. is possible here. It's <laughs> a great option. Yeah. And then when that baby got fussy, she was just right there, right. you know, ready to help him in that same really responsive way. Yeah. I think being able to have all those children there together, mm -hmm. the environment supported each one of them where they were developmentally, right. but she was able to be there very close to address their needs. Yeah, so it was really um, sort of what you said, those that flexible space, flexible environment, but then it's a really talented teacher who's able to bring it all together and support that. Yeah, definitely. And I think those responsive environments mm -hmm. are you know, directly related to offering that responsive approach. Absolutely. So, Alyssa, thank you so much. What a pleasure to get to talk to you again. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. And remember, if you have any questions about creating a responsive learning environment, please send them in, and Alyssa will respond to your questions during our coffee break. The Coffee Break episode will be posted and available on the My Peers group in two weeks. Now we have one of my favorite segments here on Teacher Time. We get to hear from teachers. This teacher tells us that in order to set up uh, your environment um, and decide when to make changes and adaptations, you really need to observe children and understand their families. As you notice their interests and developmental levels change, you can make appropriate changes to your learning environment. This happens to be a classroom teacher, but this is just as true for family child care providers. Let's take a look. 
So when you are working with infants to toddlers, I know there's a lot around the environment that you need to change to kind of meet the interests that you have, that the children have at the moment. Can you tell me kind of how you figure out what they're interested in and how to set up the classroom so that you're really meeting those interests? Well, it's really all observation. You really have to observe each and every child to really understand what they are. You have to get to know their family life, build those relationships, not with just the child, but with their families as well. So you understand why their interests, what they're interested in outside of here as well mm -hmm. as while they're here. Having those personal relationships is big as well. So then when you see what their interest and their abilities are, then you can bring in materials to help support that and help them build and scaffold upon their learning. So it's co it's a constant observation and if something Something's not working, you put it away and you bring something out. So it's kind of that um, just guess and <laughs> see if they're interested. But you also have to introduce them to new stuff because you're not, they're really not going to know all their interests until they see a wide variety of materials. So sometimes bringing things in just to kind of see what happens. Kind of experimental. Yeah. Hey, here's something new. What yeah. can we do with it this time? Yeah. So one thing I noticed that teacher really talk about is um, is really stepping back and taking a moment to observe what's working in this environment, what's not working in this environment for children, and then being able to sort of reflect and think like, okay, what can we do to make this environment really work? That is so true. Yeah. I love the idea also of experimenting with new materials mm -hmm. or even occasionally new room arrangements. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Yeah. Really good stuff. Yeah, I like that too. Mm -hmm. um, We'd like to hear from you about your learning environments on my pairs, and you can find the link in the viewer's guide. Okay. Okay, now it's time for you to try it out. Mm -hmm. In the video we just watched, the teacher was talking about setting up the environment and adding new materials so children can experiment and try things on their own. Your homework is to try adding one or two new materials to your indoor and or outdoor learning environments and then just observe how the children explore them. Please let us know how it goes on my pairs. Great. Now we're going to hear from Peter Pizzolongo from the National Center on Early Childhood Development, Teaching and Learning. Peter is going to talk about the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework and how to create a learning environment that supports children's perceptual, motor, and physical development. Let's have a look. I'm Peter Pizzolongo, Director of Training and Technical Assistance Services at the National Center on Early Childhood Development, Teaching and Learning, NCECDTL. For this portion of teacher time, we'll focus on ELOF, the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework, ages birth to five. The ELOF is a framework that represents the continuum of learning for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. What children should know and be able to do during their formative years, from birth through age five. ELOF outlines and describes the skills, behaviors, and concepts that early Head Start and Head Start programs must foster in all children, including children who are dual language learners and children with disabilities. ELOF is organized in a way that can help teachers and families understand child development and guide the ways in which we help children learn. You can learn more about ELOF by going to the ELOF pages on the ECLKC website, the Office of Head Start's Early Childhood Learning and Knowledge Center. For today's topic, creating a responsive environment for young children, this ELOF segment focus is on the domain perceptual, motor, and physical development. This domain includes goals for perception, fine and gross motor development, and health, safety, and nutrition. Perception refers to children's use of their senses to gather and understand information and respond to the world around them. We know that the use of perceptual information is central to infants and toddlers' interactions, exploration, and understanding their experiences. Think about how infants and toddlers use their senses as they engage in activities that use their fine and gross motor skills, observing, handling and using objects, using depth perception to plan on how to move in an area with obstacles. Motor skills support children in fully exploring their environment and interacting with people, so these skills support development in all domains. Children's physical well-being depends on a number of factors, including their knowledge and use of safe, healthy behaviors and routines. 
As we think about today's teacher time topic, let's consider how you use your environment to support the natural learning that infants and toddlers engage in every day. We'll see a video of children engaged in a jumping activity and then talk about some of the goals and examples of the developmental progression that these children are exhibiting. Be sure to focus on how children are using perception, motor skills, and safe behaviors as they jump from the cushion blocks. Good words. Thank you for letting them know you were jumping. Daddy, watch out! You're okay. You're okay, Livy. You're okay. Go for it. Watch me. Watch me. I'm watching. Whoa, good job. A big five. A big five? Yeah. Oh, Carbon's taking it from the lower step. Whoa! There was a lot to see in that video. One of the ELOF goals for children from birth through 36 months is child demonstrates effective and efficient use of large muscles for movement and position. The developmental progression skills that children engage in as they're working toward this goal include learning new muscle coordination and gaining control of a variety of movements, which you saw examples of in the video. And I'm sure your curriculum also includes experiences that promote children learning new concepts and skills in this domain. Reflecting on the video, did you notice other examples of goals and developmental progression for the perceptual, motor, and physical development domain as children exhibited various skills? Did you notice a child with a safety concern as she prepared to jump and another child is standing in front and she says, watch out! Another child jumped and landed on his bottom, an example of a child learning to perfect his jumping skills, but not at the level of the girl who jumped before him. And I love seeing the child who moved down to a lower step before jumping, being aware of his own strengths and what he can do at this time. Knowing the developmental progression for this domain and the strengths, interests, and needs of each child in the group, teachers know how to best support children learning new concepts and practicing new skills. In the video, we saw the teachers sitting nearby, but not on top of the children. She noted what they were doing, helping them to be aware of their actions, and offered words of encouragement as they jumped. Moving on to other goals in this domain, I'd like to also note that teachers take individual differences into account, as well as children's cultures. In some cultures, children use utensils to eat that require a great deal of eye-hand coordination. Also, food preferences are culturally based, and some children might not want to eat foods that are considered healthy and tasty in other cultures. Children with disabilities may require adaptations or assistive technology to help them move or use their small muscles. Understanding where each child is, what her strengths, interests, and needs are, begins with understanding how children grow and develop. The ELOF is a tool for teachers to use to help with that understanding. I hope that this segment has helped you to better understand the Early Learning Outcomes Framework and you recognize how the ELOF can help you to be a better caregiver. Thank you so much, Peter. I love the video of the children jumping. Those foam blocks really offer an opportunity to tailor the learning environment to be responsive to where children are developmentally. They can jump, roll, roll, crawl, and climb with those. That was great. I love how careful that little girl was about making sure her friend didn't get hurt. Yes. She understood her body enough to know that she was jumping and it could hurt him, yes. but really overestimated how far she could jump. Mm -hmm. That's such important learning. Yes. So now we're moving on to talk about how the learning environment can really support relationships. We have Amy Hunter back with us from the National Center on Health and Wellness for our Relationship Building Minute. Amy, welcome. Oh, so great to be here yeah. again with you. Thank you so much for coming back. So um, before we really get started talking, I want to share a video where we have a teacher who's really talking about sort of a situation where she had an environment that was causing a lot of challenging behaviors. So um, she was able to kind of step back and make a plan and figure out how to adjust the room to work better for the children and the adults. So let's go ahead and watch that video. Great. The classroom used to be kind of wide open. Um, furniture wasn't all where you saw it placed today. And uh, they used to just kind of run laps. 
For classroom management and safety, we've um, we just decided to kind of play with the furniture a little bit and put it in the middle of the classroom, you know, in just different spots and angles that'll be comfortable and good for all of us. We just try to keep everything accessible to the children because anything in that room, they, they're able to go for at any point of the day. Um, we do focus on certain things, um, like in our lesson plans, but if they're not interested in it, and they're completely going another route. We just follow, okay, that's what you want to do today. All right, we'll go right on with you and then we'll keep it going from there. That teacher was so good about coming up with some strategies to figure out what she could do to make the environment work for this group of children. Um, what kind of ideas and strategies can our viewers take away from this for their own spaces? Well, the first thing I just want to notice about that video that I so appreciate is how reflective she was, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Like that was what just struck me as the first thing is she was really reflective mm -hmm. of, I have this concern of the children running in my space, which could be unsafe. Right. And let me think about that. Let me step back and problem solve. What can I do to change the environment to make those um, behaviors be reduced or to, you know, have a more appropriate environment for them yeah. to feel safe, to be safe, and for us all to have better relationships in that That's space. That's so wonderful. And that that reflection is incredibly valuable in teaching process, practice, but it also takes a lot of time. Um, and sometimes sort of needs to be supported. So that's a, sort of something to remember, is that it's helpful to have somebody to reflect with as well sometimes. Right. You know, there were a number of other things I noticed mm -hmm. about that video that, I mean, the first thing is the, the environment of yes, and I know you guys yeah. have been talking about yeah. that, but, you know, the idea that everything in that classroom is open to the children. You know, so basically there isn't anything in there that they can't do or right. explore. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine how that cuts down on power struggles yes. and it cuts down on, you know, her having to say, no, don't stop. Right. Right. Which we really want to avoid. Yeah. We want to have the teacher there as a facilitator mm -hmm. of relationships, a facilitator of exploration. Um, so the environment of yes and everything is yours here mm -hmm. to explore really facilitates that. I just want to point out that in the viewer's guide we have a few resources that will talk about sort of how to notice if you're saying no all the time to think about ways to look at your environment and kind of create that environment of yes where children are allowed to do whatever they can do. Right. Well, and when she is not in the position of being a policewoman or a right. monitor of the environment, she can really spend time in relationship with the children, yeah, right? You want. know, following their right. lead. What are they interested in? Mm -hmm. Really sitting down with them, being present yeah. because her mind isn't, you know, worrying about are they going to hurt themselves or get right. into something that they shouldn't. Um, she can really be with them right there in the moment. So wonderful. Again, we have this theme of the one of the most important things in the learning environment is these relationships with the adults as well. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we kind of talk about a lot is room arrangement and materials and that sort of thing. Um, but again, this theme that I think we've sort of seen throughout today's episode of um, the, the adults and their relationships with the children are really some of the most important parts of any environment. Absolutely. So, so we know that, and yet I think it's also extremely helpful to have some visual ideas and some really specific strategies about what it can look like to have various aspects of the environment that are really responsive. So I know you brought some pictures we're going to go ahead and take a look at. Great. And the, and the physical environment can facilitate that piece that you said is the most important, the yes. relationships. Um, so this first picture I love because it really reflects something I know you all have been talking about mm -hmm. around um, bringing in culturally responsive practices and welcoming all families mm -hmm. and making that connection between home and the program environment. Yes. Um, and so I think you can all see this hopefully well, but the 
families were asked to make posters, and it includes, you know, pictures from home. It includes things that are important to them, and you know, this really creates, you know, a culturally responsive environment where families can feel connected to the program and bring a piece of themselves into the program. It's so valuable to have、um, really the actual families, like in the community. That you're in, I think, is is so important over and above things that you could buy and posters you can put up. I mean, this really means a lot to the children. And I know I've seen in classrooms where sometimes when children get upset, they will go to those photos of their families or they'll carry them around. Sometimes it's really helpful for them. And another strategy, just that I've seen to facilitate this kind of thing, is、um, I've heard some programs give the disposable cameras、oh, yeah. to families、mm-hmm. so that they can take pictures of their family. They can take Pictures of their environment, of their pet, you know, all、right. those kinds of things that then they can bring into the classroom to post, so that the children can see that connection. And you know, when they are feeling like they're missing home, they can you know see those pictures right there. That's really wonderful. There's so many、um, wonderful benefits to this simple strategy.、Mm-hmm. So I think we have another picture here. We do. Oh, I, I'm going to say I love all these pictures. I know because I do. Don't you want to just go sit down in a rocking chair and hold a baby there? Well, I think that that feeling that、yes. you're bringing up is really important. So you look at this environment and you think, I would want to be in that. Yes,、right? I do.、Uh, <laughs> yeah, and one, let's point out a few things about the environment.、Um, one is the adult-sized rocking chairs,、mm-hmm. right?、Mm-hmm. So that adults can be comfortable as they hold babies,、yes. right?、Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I would notice about this picture in particular is the subdued colors.、Mm-hmm. And it makes me think, you know, we all love going to the spa,、mm-hmm. right? And one of the things when we walk into a spa is it's really calm and subdued,、mm-hmm. and help us helps us feel calm and secure、right. and comfortable and relaxed.、Mm-hmm. Um, and in this kind of space where the colors are subdued, it's the children that stand out. Right? Yes. It's the relationships. It's the people、mm-hmm. in the environment. It's not the distraction of all the overwhelming colors and.、Yeah. Um, But there, there's many things about this environment that are are really special. The area of the couch for the children and、yeah. the child size furniture. I love the little child size side table on the couch too. You can maybe see a sippy cup hanging out there while they flip through a book.、Right. <laughs> well, and that brings up the point that this feels like a home. It does. And so, really、mm-hmm. sending the message to the children: this is your home. Yeah. And it is right. It's their home away from home.、Oh, yeah.、Um, and so, helping children、uh, and families feel like this: this is a family here.、Mm-hmm. Relationships are just like a home relationship. Yeah.、Here. I just want to point one more thing out about this picture, which I notice that there's a sweet little cozy area too, where children. You know, you were saying、yeah. sometimes kids spend a lot of time、mm-hmm. in the classroom,、right. and this offers a space where they can feel. Like they're kind of by themselves,、um, but there's no problem with supervision. So that's really important、yeah. that young children have a space to go and either be with a small number of children, maybe one other friend,、right. or maybe two, you know, two friends, but or by themselves. Yeah, you know, they're with children in many. T- Programs for many hours,、yeah. and so having that space where they can、um, decompress、mm-hmm. and be alone that is really helpful. Yeah, and actually, I think one of our chat people said like a place where children can go and sort of relax is、mm-hmm. really valuable in her classroom too. So we have this other fabulous picture, so beautiful. Yeah, so lots of things to point out about this picture too.、Mm-hmm. One is the slide and the stairs,、mm-hmm. right? And I know we like to talk about that. Children this age love to climb, right. right? And so you want to <laughs> give them that space to climb, right? Right. They're going to climb、over. either way, right? Yes.、Yeah, so better to have something that they can climb, right? And what's nice about this particular piece of furniture is that more than one child, you know, there's no waiting.、Mm-hmm. That that is two、so、children can go、mm-hmm. together. They can slide together, and that、yeah. facilitates relationships. Right? We're in the relationship minute,、uh, right? And so we can see that they can spend time together, you know, doing that activity together. Yeah, toddlers don't really like to wait. <laughs>、no. Have you noticed? I have noticed yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>、uh, a couple other things to point out about this. I, don't you love the windows? It's so nice. I just imagine the interactions that can sort of happen peeking through that window. Right. And we talk about relationships. Those. You know,、um, 
arrivals and mm, departures sure. and how this window facilitates you know the coming and going mm -hmm. uh, as well as relationships with the outside world you can imagine you know a couple of children mm -hmm. sitting in the pillow area just looking out and learning about the world absolutely yeah, I think we have one more picture. I love this photo. <laughs> yeah. well, I was fortunate enough to be there when this was taking place. But, you know, some things to point out here is the teacher is on the ground with the children, mm -hmm. yet she has a back support. Yes. And so she's comfortable, mm -hmm. which facilitates her to focus on exactly what she should be focusing on is the relationship there with the children. Yeah. I love that. They're sort of sitting on the floor. I like that this tub is on the floor where the children can reach it so mm. that we know kids are going to be at all sorts of levels of physical development. Um, so they're not going to have to be worrying about like their ability to stand or even sit up because she's there to support children so they can just go ahead and um, play without worrying about some of that muscle control. Right. And play they did. I mean, they, they, did. Were, they were in there, right? They were, you know, putting all of those <laughs> things in their mouth. They were feeling all of the dis different textures and those teachers absolutely supported that exploration, which is exactly what we It want. looks like the teachers were having a really good time too. Yeah. That's absolutely. really nice. So we have this, another photo here. I believe this is our last one. Okay. <laughs> um, this photo, I want to point out, it may be hard to see, but in the back wall there, mm -hmm. it's a window okay. into the next classroom. And so if you think about mm -hmm. um, children and facilitating relationships with other peers or other caregivers in the room next door, yeah. they don't leave, they're just next door, and they can see them oh. through that window. Right? That's so nice, because I know I've, I've heard stories from parents about their child sort of moving up to the next classroom, and it can be really distressing to right. and so that imagine they love. Yeah. that they're seeing that same caregiver right, right there on the other side of yeah. the wall. And you see on this picture as well the stairs, mm -hmm. and so the same thing, they can climb those stairs as many times as they like. <laughs> I was going to say, you know when kids are sort of right at that age and all they want to do is practice going up and down the stairs, so that's a really nice mm -hmm. opportunity for them to be able to do that. So um, I have to say, we saw some great photos and we had some you know, great video and conversation and it's beautiful and I, I know there are gonna be ideas people can take back to their program. Um, but again, once again, I find myself feeling like, wow, we are asking so much of teachers, of the adults who are working with young children and their families. And um, that kind of moves us nicely to the sort of resiliency and wellness conversation that we like to have as well, where we talk about um, how do we support the adults, how do we support the staff, and, um, and since this is about environments, so what kinds of things can we think about um, to create an environment of wellness for staff? Oh, it's such an important question, and we've been spending a lot of time focusing on staff wellness, and staff has so appreciated that. Uh, but one of the things I think about is the very first time, you know, the staff member walks through the door in the morning, mm -hmm. what, is it, what is that environment like for the staff member? You know, when they walk through the door in the morning, are they greeted, you know, with someone friendly face to say, hey, good morning, how are you? And really mean it. You, you know, know, I think about that for children and families, how important it is that we greet children when they come into the classroom. And honestly, I hadn't really thought about how important that might feel for staff. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's critical to think about what is the environment for staff mm -hmm. so that they can bring their very best self to the environment yes. to build those relationships with children and families. Yeah. And so thinking about the kinds of, you know, the mental health climate or the, the social emotional climate <clears throat> that supports adults in that space, right. the staff. Yeah. Uh, so what is it like for them to walk in the door? How do they feel supported? What kinds of things are taking place to build relationships among staff, mm -hmm. um, among administrators and staff? Mm -hmm. And we know that no matter how positive the environment might be in terms of a great workplace, there are also going to be conflicts. Yes. You know, it's just of human course. nature. There of will course. be some conflicts. And so how are conflicts talked about? How are they managed? How are they surfaced? Are, you know, how do we talk about when we're having a hard time? Yeah. I think that's also critical. Yeah, um, so having some really supportive strategies in place where mm -hmm. people can sort of think about and manage when there are issues between people because it will happen even in the best work environment. And what, what about when staff feel insecure 
or when mm -hmm. staff feel like they've maybe made a mistake or they maybe don't know what to do. Yeah. Who do they talk to? Yeah. Is that an environment that it's okay to say, I am really unsure about how to manage the situation or how to work with this particular child mm -hmm. to support them or how to build a relationship with this family? Yeah. And, and is that kind of insecurity or, or not knowing fostered in the environment so that it's okay and it's a, it's a learning environment? I was for just staff. thinking that that ability to self reflect and think, like, I don't know if I'm really doing the right thing here is such an opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. It is really, it's a space where people are supported then in their own learning about their own practice. Yeah. There are also some really practical things that okay. can be done, um, and we've actually heard many of these strategies from programs themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but things like there was a director that shared with me what I thought was a phenomenal idea. He actually encouraged his staff to take a well day, to call wow. in well. I mean, it sounds kind of amazing, but his, his thinking was, don't wait till you're sick. Yeah. Don't wait till you're burnt out. If you need a day to go mm -hmm. and recharge and play so that you can come back and bring your best self to working with children and families, do it. What a message about the importance of who you are when you show up at Absolutely. work. Absolutely. Really nice. And that balance, right? That, yeah. you know, you aren't just a worker here. Mm -hmm. You are a person with a family, with the relationships at home, and do what you need to do yeah. so that you can be your best self. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've covered so many wonderful things here. Um, and I really appreciate your coming and talking to us again, both for the Relationship Building Minute and the Resiliency and Wellness Minute. Sure, happy to be here, thank you. Well, this has been another really fun episode of Teacher Time. I loved how we got to see so many videos of teachers yes. doing out there doing the great work they do with infants and toddlers. That's true. Remember, if you have any questions, mm -hmm. send them in through the chat box, and Alyssa will answer them during the next Coffee Break episode. Keep the fun and conversation going by joining us on the My Peers Teacher Time community. To check it out, follow the link in the viewer's guide. Please fill out the evaluation. We love to hear what you think and what you'd like to see. And when you fill out the evaluation, you'll be able to print out a certificate. And a special thank you to all of our guests. Yes. Please, all of you, join us next time when we will be talking about the, the importance of responsive interactions and how that fits in with every aspect of your curriculum. Remember that the learning environment where you and the children spend so much time can be warm and welcoming. Make the most of the space you have. That's right. And now, our moment of learning. Enjoy some giggles. Thank you, Axel. You gave me a big love. You want to see Miss Rachel, Axel? Yes. You see how you just hit me because you threw it up? You need to be safe. Yes? Mr. Law, Mr. Shelly told me.